Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first for 2021 uh, webinar on radiation protection in medical uses of ionizing radiation, organized by the International Water <laughs> Energy Agency. Uh, I am Zenia Vasilieva, a radiation protection specialist at the Radiation Protection of Patients Unit of the IAEA, and I will be moderator of the today webinar. The webinar will last approximately 60 minutes, including a specific uh, question and answer period at the end of the lecture. The microphones and cameras of participants are disabled during the entire uh, session, but you can uh, still ask your questions, uh, submitting them by uh, writing in the Q&A box that is located on the right hand side of the screen, uh, or if you are using a mobile device, uh, you can uh, locate uh, the Q&A or chat box as uh, it is named in uh, different devices. Uh, please note that the IA is not offering certification for its webinar. The webinar today is organized jointly with two uh, international uh, professional societies, the Cardiovascular and Interventional Radiological Society of Europe, CIRSE, and the International Organization for Medical Physics, IOMP. And this is the second in the series of joint IES CIRSE IOMP webinar. Today, we'll learn from two renowned experts what is new in understanding radiation risks for patients in fluoroscopy guided interventional procedures. This is important because of the growing use of uh, this procedure in place of uh, open surgery. Uh, and despite of the undisputable benefits of these minimally invasive interventions, the radiation risk should be quantified and reduced as much as possible, maintaining the clinical benefits. Early 1990, uh, 1990, the risks of tissue injuries like skin burns in patients and eye lens injuries in intervention list had gone into tension. Uh, and what we know that these uh, tissue reactions happen uh, only when those two organs exceed the specific threshold, starting from 0 0.5 for eye lens and 2 gray for higher for skin and higher for skin. And, uh, the severity depends upon the dose. The, the second group of uh, effects that we know are stochastic effects that are probabilistic in nature, and this is uh, mostly cancer, or if with uh, much lower probability, hereditary effects, genetic effects. Data for these effects uh, come from epidemiological studies demonstrating increased cancer risk at doses above uh, 100 millisiever and projected uh, to the lower dose range. The linear no threshold model of cancer risk at low dose, LNT model, is the one accepted for the purposes of radiation protection. Uh, and in this model, we assume that the probability of cancer incidence in excess to the natural occurrence uh, above the uh, um, natural uh, cancer incidence increases with radiation dose above the natural background. It's also known that the cancer risk depends upon the age, gender, and in individual radiosensitivity. In order to develop proper strategy uh, for protection uh, for patients, for managing risks for patients, we need to first understand these risks. And today we will discuss uh, this topic with two respected experts, well-known uh, experts in the field, Professor Werner Jaske and Professor uh, Madan Rihani. Uh, Dr. Jaske is an interventional radiologist. He was director and chair of the Department of Radiology at Medical University of Innsbruck until recently. He has extensive experience in interventional radiology, especially in endovascular procedures in the body. He is the chair of the Radiation Protection Subcommittee of the CIRSE uh, and is also representing CIRSE in Eurosafe Imaging Campaign and in relevant European uh, Commission tenders. 
since 2014, she has been involved in organizing the CIRS's very successful initiative, Radiation Protection Pavilion, during the annual awareness campaign for radiation safety uh, during the, the annual congresses. Uh, Dr. Ryalski has authored uh, more than 300 papers in scientific uh, journals, and in 2019, he was invited to present an Andreas Grunzig lecture at the CIRSE annual meeting in Barcelona in acknowledgement of his outstanding contribution to the to interventional radiology. Uh, the, Dr. Madan Rikhani, uh, who is the president, current president of IOMP and representing uh, IOMP in uh, this meeting, also doesn't need uh, uh, introduction, but still few words about um, uh, his background. Uh, he is uh, currently director of Global Outreach for Radiation Protection at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, USA. He worked previously as a radiation protection specialist at the IAEA for 11 years and as a professor at the head of medical physics at All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi, India. Dr. Rehani is a member of the International Commission of Radiological Protection, ICP. He is a co-author of eight annals of the ICP, four of which he served as chair of the task group. He is a senior editor at the British Journal of Radiology, associate editor of medical physics, has published uh, many papers, more than 160 papers and books, chapters, 39 book chapters, and has edited five books. Uh, with this introduction, it, and with no further delay, I want to give word to our speaker. Uh, and. Uh, to start the discussion uh, of the topic, uh, I want to first ask Dr. Yaske uh, on his opinion on uh, the benefits of um, interventional procedures. What are the real benefits of work with guided interventional procedures? We always say that the benefits should exceed risks. Uh, what are the benefits that make us feel that this is true? Okay, thank you very much, Yenya. Welcome everybody to this webinar, which I think is a great idea to bring together specialists from radiation protection and from interventional radiology. Fluoroscopy guided interventions are a real success story. Uh, nearly 60 years ago, Charles Dotto performed the first angioplasty and from then on, we had a continuous, very fast development of this technique. In the early 70s, Andreas Grünzig developed the first balloon catheter and performed the first balloon angioplasties of peripheral arteries, renal arteries, and later on in coronaries. Now, what a striking Can advantage. I yes? See your slides. Uh, yes, you. I get your slides here. <laughs> yeah. Um, the major advantages of uh, fluoroscopy guided interventions are listed here. Uh, they are associated with less operative trauma, less pain, faster recovery of patients, and a shorter hospital stay. That's probably the reason why uh, they are a very attractive uh, alternative to open surgery. Now, fluoroscopy, fluoroscopy guided interventions are mainly percutaneous endovascular procedures for the treatment of arterial occlusive disease in various uh, organ or ter body territories, the treatment of aneurysms, acute and chronic hemorrhage, and tumors. Let me show you an example, a case study, which uh, illustrates the big advantages of endovascular therapy. This patient underwent aortic arch replacement for type A aortic dissection. This is a very complicated procedure and involves a lot of operative trauma. He developed as a complication of the procedure 
a pseudoaneurysm at the anastomosis between the craft and the brachiocephalic trunk. Uh, he also uh, demonstrated a mediastinal hematoma, which probably originated from the pseudoaneurysm, which uh, tended to bleed intermittently. So we have a situation which is a vascular emergency. Pseudoaneurysms have a high risk of rupture and severe hemorrhage. Now to uh, fix this problem, there were two, pro uh, two uh, approaches, uh, open surgery or endovascular therapy. Now open surgery would mean that you have to reopen the chest. Uh, you have to fix this problem from the outside with a high risk of uh, severe hemorrhage, because when you open the chest, this uh, leak here will probably start to bleed severely. The endovascular approach is different. You come from the inside, you position a stent craft uh, at the site of the pseudoaneurysm, you release a stent, a stent craft and balloon it, and here you can see the problem is fixed. You only need local anesthesia, and the patient does not have to go to intensive care unit. This does not only save uh, a lot of pain and trauma to the patient, but it also saves money, and it decreases the need for the uh, stay in an ICU unit. There's another problem why uh, endovascular therapy was probably so successful. The caseload of vascular problems is increasing because our population is aging. And with the aging comes along an increasing incidence of vascular diseases. And to manage this caseload, I think it's very important to have uh, therapeutic alternatives to open surgery, which are uh, cheaper and uh, involve more uh, less a trauma to the patient and can be done on an outpatient basis. You see the steady increase of the incidence of peripheral arterial occlusive disease on this uh, slide, uh, panel, and uh, the same is true for coronary artery disease. It's still the number one killer in uh, uh, worldwide and in developed countries especially. Now, along with this, you can see from 1991 to, till 2011, over a time period of 20 years, we saw an exponential growth in PCI activities, percutaneous coronary interventions. And you could demonstrate the same craft for peripheral artery disease, for treatment of hepatocellular carcinomas and for treatment of aneurysms. And along with this, the number of installed angiographic systems increased and the numbers of systems sold worldwide also increased. So this clearly indicates that uh, fluoroscopy guided interventions made their way into modern medicine and uh, there is nothing uh, which could replace this, this, uh, these techniques. Now, the downside, of course, of this success story is that uh, we have uh, to deal with uh, your ionizing radiation. And there are several drivers of radiation exposure in patients. Uh, first of all, more and more operators and medical specialists use FGIs, not only trained radiologists, but also other specialists. The caseload per app operator is increasing, so more and more people have to be trained to manage the caseload. Uh, it's not always guaranteed that you have adequate training with respect to uh, handling the equipment, endovascular devices, managing the vascular pathology, and of course also managing radiation protection successfully. Catheterization skills have to be trained, 
And if this is done in patients, you have to have close uh, supervision. Uh, awareness for radiation uh, effects uh, are very important. The operator has to know which uh, risks are associated with radiation exposure. Another issue are, or is that angiographic equipment gets more and more powerful. The operator has nearly no restrictions on delivering dose to the patient. Uh, the only thing um, he has to handle is that he gets off the pedal. The machine won't stop him. This was different nearly uh, 30 years or 20 years ago, where you had 30, certain limitations regarding the heat load of the tube. Then there is an increasing demand for higher high resolution imaging, which also is associated with higher doses usually, especially uh, the anatomy you manage is smaller and smaller. If you think about uh, treatment of a cerebral aneurysm or coronary arteries, you have rather a small anatomy. And uh, of course, uh, you need detailed views of this anatomy. And uh, endovascular devices get more and more filigree. And then we have new uh, types of imaging like comb beam CT, which also add to the dose. And another problem we have to deal with more and more is unfavorable patient anatomy. Patients are usually uh, sicker than they used to be, more and more obese patients, and also more and more very old patients with challenging anatomies. So let me hand over now to Madan Rehani. Madan, could you elaborate on what are the potential radiation risks? Thank you, Werner. Thank you, Zenia. Thank you, participants. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, as the case may be. It's a very pertinent point to talk about the radiation risk, and Zenia, in her introductory address, mentioned briefly about the possible risks. So let us see. Traditionally, we uh, the ICRP and most organizations have divided the risks into two categories: the tissue reactions so-called deterministic effects, and second, the stochastic risks. And traditionally, it has been mentioned and taught that in interventional procedures, one needs to be concerned mainly with the tissue reactions, and the stochastic risks are important mainly in children. So that is has been the traditional teaching all these years, and uh, let us see if the same teaching stands or should stand. Let's first talk briefly about the tissue reactions. I'm sure everyone in the, in the participating today knows about various uh, tissue reactions which have been reported in the literature. So this is these tissue injuries are something not new to the participants. Also, the IAA itself had organized a webinar, and the recorded webinar is available on the IAA website. This was the radiation-induced skin injuries in interventional procedure. This was the webinar of 5th April 2016. And another webinar on 16 May 2019 was on patient radiation management in interventional fluoroscopies. This was the webinar given by Dr. Balter. So with this background, uh, traditionally, if uh, um, uh, one asks an interventionalist, uh, have you come across a case of skin injury? In 1990s, uh, the typical reply used to be no. I cannot expect this from what I do. This used to be the typical reply. Then in the next decade, the answer changed from that to no, not from our own practice, but from some others I have seen. 
but when we ask that how many of your patients have more than five gray at the reference point and th there is no answer typically so that shows the lack of awareness on the part of interventionalists making guesswork so if the message which is still valid is that injuries could be happening but they are not getting detect detected and reported the situation which has been lasting for last almost two decades or a little more that typically 10 cases are filed in the us courts per year so around that figure is still remaining so let us see what how do we do how do we handle these cases for example at my hospital where i work currently massachusetts general hospital there is a requirement of the state of massachusetts that every patient who has the reference air karma dose of more than 2 gray should be reported to the radiation safety committee and from ncrp the national council on radiation protection and measurement there is a level of 5 gray and more i mean there, there is a level can be variable and uh, that is what is recommended for reporting to the radiation safety committee so we have every month a meeting of the radiation safety committee and we get the reports from interventional radiology interventional uh, cardiology and other departments as to how many cases are falling in this and then we have a mechanism in place for follow up and reporting back to radiation safety committee by so with that let me ask dr jsk how is the widest of tissue injuries uh, handled in your practice and in your experience at other centers thank you very much madan um let me briefly comment on this um National legislations and international basic safety standards responded to the increased number of radiation induced skin injuries and loss of hair. So as operators, uh, we have to identify procedures which may pose a risk of excessive doses to the patient. And from the literature and our own database, we identified a list of procedures which implies such a risk. But then there are other factors which are not related necessarily to the procedure, but to other factors which may pose a high risk for the patient. And as I pointed out before, high body weight is a risk. And if you have a procedure which you expect to be very difficult and which might might you you may need a long time and a lot of uh, fluoroscopy uh, the same thing is true if you perform uh, repeated procedures very common in neuro interventions for example also in coronary interventions where you perform uh, a procedure in the same region within three months then special attention has to be paid to pediatric and young adults. This will be dealt with later on in this uh, webinar. Then, of course, pregnancy, which is a very rare uh, situation for us. Uh, emergency bleeding, for example, in pregnant women who had a severe pelvic trauma may be a special risk, but uh, at least in my career, I encountered this only one, one, one time. Then patients with increased radiosensitivity, patients respond very differently to radiation, but there are some patients who are especially prone uh, to radiation injuries, and we know this from radiation therapy. And of course, if radiation therapy has been applied before, which is also a very rare situation. Now, we have to train the operators, of course, First of all, uh, the operator has to know how he can estimate the skin dose to the patient. And as a surrogate parameter, we use the air karma at the interventional reference point. This is not skin dose, but somewhat it is related in most cases to skin dose. Only recently, uh, we uh, 
introduced, at least in our institution, skin maps. And uh, they give quite a good idea where the, the skin area is, which is at risk. So to read the DICOM dose report, which shows up at the end of each procedure, is a, a must for every operator who performs an FGI. Uh, we use a dose management system, which gives us a good record of the doses applied to the same region of the body in a particular patient. And of course, we train our fellows and residents uh, use, using simulators. They can learn how to catheterize with, with, without applying uh, radiation. And uh, in addition, they get, get a good feedback how much radiation they uh, apply to the patient and how much radiation they receive themselves. Uh, especially important, as was pointed out by Madan, is the concept of substantial radiation dose or trigger levels. Uh, in our institution, we use the trigger levels according to the CSA guidelines, uh, peak skin dose at 3 cray, because we don't know the exact skin dose. We use the air camera at reference point. We set this conservatively at 4 cray, and only a very few patients, less than 5% at our institution, receive a dose larger than at or larger than five cray. Most of them are from uh, cardiac interventions. Uh, the other parameters like uh, dose area product and fluoroscopy time are not so commonly used as, as trigger levels uh, in our institution. Another uh, way to uh, manage uh, trigger levels is a reporting system of the IAEA. And uh, they also set trigger levels uh, similar to what I just pointed out. Um, the trigger values are very similar. Uh, cumulative air karma at or larger than five cray. Peak skin growth larger than three cray. And all the other parameters are not as practical or not as uh, accurate. So uh, we uh, recommend to use the dose area product or the cumulative air karma at the reference point. Other trigger events are also mentioned here. They should be uh, reported to this uh, system, to the database. Uh, in most European countries, uh, we now have also to report uh, these um, uh, ex excessive doses to public authorities. However, they, the way of how they are reported are quite different from country to country. So I cannot go in detail into this. What we also use at our uh, institution is when a trigger level is reached or succeeded, exceeded, we um, uh, send an email or the dose management system sends automatically an email to the operator indicating the excessive dose. And uh, this dose alert then triggers uh, several other steps which are necessary to handle the situation, and I will come back to this later on. So let me now ask Madan again, what are new findings in recent years that impact on radiation risks, Madan? Thank you, Werner. Let's have a look at uh, both the, the uh, those aspects which uh, affect the tissue reaction as well as the stochastic effect. This is a paper published in Radiology from our hospital. It's two years ago. And in, in this, we had estimated for this from 2010 to 2017 for eight years, how the number of cases have been reducing in two dose categories, that is two gray to five gray at reference point, and this is uh, more than five gray. So that, that is the, the way we have seen things are. So this data was for 41,000 plus uh, interventional procedure, 
and the percentage uh, went down by threefold during this time for two to five gray and it went by 8.2 fold for uh, those uh, in the five gray. So somebody I saw was asking question was uh, in the chat uh, and uh, he can get a feeling of the percentage values and how they have gone down uh, at our center in that. Another important uh, paper which I thought uh, is a new information, I was looking for papers uh, who have surveyed the incidence of radiation induced uh, dermatitis, radiodermatitis in the fluoroscopy. This was a publication from France with more than 55,000 patients who underwent uh, FGI procedure during 2010 to 2016. Sorry for the typo. So they had 359 um, patients who crossed uh, the level, uh, uh, and it was uh, 91 were examined by the dermatologist for radiodermatitis with the median time of the procedure was 31, uh, after the procedure was 31.2 months. Eight patients uh, out of the 55,000, uh, that is one in 7,000 had chronic, uh, chronic radiodermatitis and 19, that is one in 3,000 had acute dermatitis. So that way one gets a feeling of how many patients are likely to have the skin effects. And the conclusion was that chronic radiodermatitis may be considered a frequent side effect in the at-risk population. The previous estimates which were drawn from paper by Miller, Balter and others, 2010, they had stated the value of one in 10,000 to one in 100,000. And uh, from that point of view, one can get a feeling that uh, one in 7,000 with chron chronic radiodermatitis is a significantly higher number than the previous reports of uh, one in 10,000 or one in 100,000. That estimate was based on um, how many cases of skin injuries have been sort of reported in the court cases and how many cases are performed in US. So it was based on that. So from that point of view, this observation is a new information. Now going to the new information with the stochastic, with the potential for stochastic effects. This is a publication from our hospital which was published in 2020 last year uh, in which we had um, cases with uh, high effective dose. Later on, I can discuss more about what dose quantity is useful. Um, many people um, prefer to talk about organ dose, but those are uh, appropriate for specific situations, not in general. So in general, effective dose is more useful quantity. So we had patients with highest effective dose of 524 millisievert from a single procedure. Then we had calculated uh, 10th, 25th, 50th, 75th, and 95th percentile for 101 interventional procedures. And these data have been published in two, these two papers uh, in additionally. So then the next paper which we uh, did is we found patients who had uh, received 100 millisievert of effective dose or more uh, from the interventional procedure. So we had analyzed data of, for almost 10 years, uh, 12 interventional radiology room, more than 46,000 procedures. Effective dose was estimated by conversion from cap value and we found the cumulative effective dose cases. So we had 4% of the patients who received cumulative effective dose of 100 millisievert or greater. 2,683 procedures were undergone by these 1,011 patients. So the main procedure were 2.7. The maximum number of procedure was 38 for a 48 year old man with end stage renal disease. The mean age at the procedure was 59, median age was 60. 41% of the patients who received uh, underwent only. The, so this is the important part of the observation that almost 42% of the patient who received more than 100 millisievert of effective dose 
underwent uh, only one fluoros uh, uh, fluoroguided procedure. So the, the dose was received essentially in one procedure, and 79% underwent all their uh, interventional procedure within 365 days. So it is not that this is protected exposure going in years. Uh, and 21 21% uh, patient underwent mean of 57.1% uh, uh, of their procedure in 365 days. So this is a categorization of the procedure. I think the next slide is better, the same data as in the previous slide, but giving in the visual form, the trauma uh, was around this cumulative effective dose, around 170. So the, the median value was around 170, 180 millisievert, and this is a spread in different clinical conditions. So this was one patient who underwent many uh, hepatocellular uh, hepato, uh, carcinoma. He underwent various procedure uh, the month after the diagnosis, 12, 21, 26, up to 66, and the effective dose and the air karma. So the distribution of these patients is that cancer cases were 37%, chronic disease of torso, 30%, internal bleeding, and 25% or so, trauma, 5%, and organ transplant and cerebrovascular. For cerebrovascular, the one needs to be aware that the conversion factor for head is small, so that's why the doses are small. There were patients uh, we identified who were age 40 years and younger. So there were uh, 108 patients were in that category with uh, in the, and dominant disorder was the chronic disease of the torso and the percentage of the cancer was very low in these cases. So it means the life expectancy can be expected to be high in this group of patients who were younger in age uh, and with reasonably higher dose. To recap the findings of this paper, so this was the first uh, ever study identifying and assessing cohort size of patients with such high doses as 100 millisievert plus, and we drew attention to the potential stochastic risk in interventional procedure and identifying health disorder and frequency contribution of uh, this. Now I'll get back to uh, Werner. Uh, what is your opinion on the stochastic risk in interventional procedure? You are muted. Well, I have to admit that stochastic risk at this point are a rather neglected issue in interventional radiology. And I think this has to do because we treat mainly patients who are rather old and uh, who have uh, usually severe disease. So usually the radiation risk is neglectable compared uh, to the risk of the disease or the state of uh, health the patient is in. Uh, another point is, and perhaps you can comment on this later on, uh, the calculation of effective dose, uh, at least as, of, as far as I know, has a rather high uh, error implied and uh, we are not sure uh, if the effective dose really gives you a good estimate of the risk of uh, severe disease on the longer run. Uh, from the linear no threshold model, of course, you can calculate a risk for every patient, but uh, we don't know uh, so far whether this model holds uh, on the long run. So what we uh, try to avoid, of course, is uh, to uh, apply high radiation doses to children and young adults. And uh, we uh, check the indications for any procedures in this group of patients very critically. If you have a benign disease in this group, uh, we would recommend to look for alternatives in treatment and treat these uh, patients only if it's really necessary. And for example, uh, in my practice, uh, one example is, which is very rare, treating portal hypertension in a very young children 
or performing uh, uh, biliary uh, strictures, treatment of biliary strictures, uh, for example, in children or young adults after liver transplant. And of course, we try to uh, uh, select a most experienced operator for these patients and uh, that we uh, take optimal radiation protection measures in this group of patients. And uh, now, of course, you can optimize the uh, settings of your angiographic equipment. You use a lower frame rate in this group of patients. Uh, you, you, you focus on the field of interest, keeping your uh, field of view as small as possible, and uh, decrease image quality if it's not necessary to have high resolution imaging. And very good tips and tricks are given in this webinar, uh, which can also be uh, viewed in the uh, video uh, service of the IAEA. So that's all I can say on this particular problem. Uh, at present, as I mentioned, I think uh, we don't really deal with this. Probably we have to uh, focus on this issue more in the future. So let me ask you, uh, Madan, again, can you throw some light on quantitative comparison of the two risks, tissue reactions and stochastic risk? Which, are, uh, which of both is more important or uh, more of a burning issue. Thank you, Werner. We had in the previous slide uh, talked about frequency of skin injury, one in 7,000. So I have taken this figure, not the higher figure of one in 10,000, because on the, one is on the safer side, taking the figure which is uh, uh, more. So the, and the frequency of stochastic risk is typically 5% per severe per 1,000. So it, it becomes one in 200 at 100 millisievert when we are dealing with 100 millisievert cases. So the stochastic risk is at 100 millisievert is 30 times, 35 times more than the tissue reaction risk. And at the median dose, which we found in our large study was 177 millisievert, it becomes 62 times more. So in a way, assuming that the risk uh, is about half of the, uh, for the patients at younger age group, at the higher age group of 50, and for younger it becomes half. So even for accounting for age still, there is 36 times uh, difference. So with that, I think uh, what practical tips you would like to mention for dealing with stochastic risk, I, I come back to you, Werner. Well, as I pointed out, the only way to manage the stochastic risk uh, at this point is to lower dose according to the ALARA principle. And um, optimizing your angiographic equipment and the way you perform the procedure is very important. So we plan the procedure ahead of time and uh, we try to avoid fluoroscopy as often as we can. Um, we optimize the settings, we target our image quality to the procedure, and of course, uh, as I pointed out before, we try to avoid the younger age group and uh, switch to MR guidance or ultrasound guidance. If this is not possible, uh, we look for uh, open surgical procedures, perhaps, which could replace our interventions. And uh, very important, I think, is that uh, we assign the most experienced operator uh, to procedures in this age group. Otherwise, I cannot give you any <laughs> real uh, good advice how, how we can handle this situation. So now, are there any official recommendations, Madan, so far on the issue of stochastic risk, like the uh, trigger values for deterministic risks? 
Thank you, uh, Varnar. Uh, every organization has mentioned about stochastic risk, right, for the for the last 30 years. In fact, stochastic risk, uh, risk used to be mentioned uh, prominently in 1980s and 1990s when the tissue reactions came. It went more into the background. So there is a mention it, but it is a question of emphasis or lack of emphasis, which has been lacking. So that is where things have been so far. So from that point of view, there is a lack of recommendation similar to what we have for tissue reactions. So where the things are on the official platform, things are not that much for tissue re uh, for the stochastic risk, uh, risk, and also they are not built up into the regulatory framework. So I think that is the situation. And the key message, I think, is uh, in addition to creating awareness of the skin injuries, we need to be aware of potential stochastic risk in interventional procedure. And I think with that, I would like to conclude this. Thank you very much. And we, Zenia, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rehani, Dr. Yaskin, for this informative uh, presentation, conversation. We are receiving a lot of questions. I will try to group them a little bit. Uh, and the first that I want to address uh, is maybe, uh, Werner, you can try. Um, the overall increase in fluoroscopy guided procedure is something we have been hearing for quite some time. Is there any model that predicts some uh, stagnation in the numbers, or is there still room for increase? And maybe I will uh, also read the second question that you can uh, answer together. Was there any time that a patient was not treated because the cumulative dose was not treated because of this, uh, I mean, uh, because of uh, exceeding some, some threshold, maybe, the question. If yes, uh, if yes what was the alternative used to, to treat the disease? Well, the first question, as I understand, is addressing the issue if there, the exponential increase will continue. Uh, uh, of course not. Nothing in the real world increases exponentially forever. And we see a leveling off of numbers of procedures uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, but of course, there are new uh, procedures coming up. Um, and every year or every other year, we see some new procedures, but um, now the efficacy of these procedures, uh, the medical ex efficacy of these, uh, these procedures has to be proven. So nowadays, uh, everybody who introduces a new procedure has to uh, come up with the proof that uh, these procedures are doing better than what we have. And uh, they are more comfortable to the patient and increase less cost. So I think uh, the numbers will increase, but not at the speed as I demonstrated from uh, 1991 till 2011. Those were really the golden days of uh, endovascular procedures. And the second question was, Again, uh, the second question was: uh, Was there any time that the patient was not treated because the cumulative dose was exceeded, exceeding some kind of trigger level or something? Yeah. Well, actually, that's a, a very rare situation uh, because in neuro interventions we have sometimes a problem if you treat a very complex pathology and uh, you have to bring the patient back several times. You get uh, doses to the skin in the range of 10 gray, and of course you have to inform the patient that he loses his air, hair, uh, and sometimes you even see some injury to the scalp. But um, usually in these patients there is no alternative for treatment, and we accept this tissue injury as a side effect of the treatment. 
uh, in children, for example, treatment of AVMs of uh, the lower extremities or in the pelvis, we usually inform the, uh, the patients, but also the parents, that we would postpone the treatment of this AVM until the child or younger adult reaches a higher age, if it's tolerable, of course. Uh, may, may I have another question that is also connected to um, it's a comment and a question. Do you have any numerical risk comparisons where open surgery is an option? Because there are other risks involved, perioperative, anesthesia, postoperative, infections, bones, mm -hmm. and outcome. Yes. Um, I think the issue of switching to uh, open surgery is mainly related to the long-term risks of radiation. If you have a younger adult or uh, a child, as Madan pointed out, uh, you expose the patient uh, with an FGI uh, to a risk which is very hard to calculate. Because even if you have a 30-fold increase, uh, of course, we know that the risk of developing cancer uh, within a lifespan of 30 or 80 years is very high, and it uh, might be, go undetected, uh, which uh, cancer is now related to radiation and which is just a, a fate of the patient. Yeah. Uh, so. In this particular case, is if there is a, a good alternative of open surgery, we would switch to open surgery, even, of course, if open surgery uh, implies a definitive operative risk. But because we don't know the risk of uh, stochastic effects on the long run, uh, or we cannot estimate this accurately, I think we have to be on the safe side. Thank you. Uh, Madam, a few questions to maybe addressing to you. Uh, you already answered the question about the uh, frequency of uh, injuries, uh, or at least uh, the frequency of exceeding the trigger of five uh, gray in air karma. Uh, there is an interesting question. Any idea of cases reported crossing these trigger levels in developing countries? And maybe I'll read the second one, uh, and you will answer together. Um, regarding the possibility of uh, injuries, do you find necessary that the radiological department should report to the national authority when the dose exceeds the trigger? Uh, thank you, Zenia. Thank you for the participant who asked the question. Yes, we had published a paper from 20 developing countries. It was published in American Journal of Rongenology. AJR in 2009 or 2010, in which we found out how many cases are exceeding. So I don't have in mind the figures involved, uh, but uh, the point was that the frequency of use of interventional procedures, particularly the cardiac ones in developing country is not less, so it's uh, significant and um, uh, proportionately one has to keep in mind that uh, how much is, is the risk there. So what was the second question you had? Uh, uh, the second was on reporting to outside the department, to the regulatory authority, for example. Um, this is what uh, IAEA uh, has this uh, uh, reporting system, uh, uh, SAFRAD, in which uh, it's, uh, there is no identification, it's anonymous uh, system. We had a lot of debate when I was working at the IAEA on this issue that uh, all reporting standards and requirements are really not uh, followed because people are worried about the penalties and uh, shaming and all that. So uh, the reporting is not done uh, accurately. So we, that's why we decided to have a reporting system in which there is no, it's, it's a kind of anonymous and voluntary. 
so IAE has that and it was mentioned by Xenia and uh, we can encourage people to do that and maybe Xenia can say a few words about uh, what has been the experience in the recent years on that reporting system. Thank you, Madam. I wanted also to add because we had a technical meeting three years ago on uh, accidental expo ex uh, exposure of patients in diagnostic and interventional radiology. Uh, and we published a paper. I would recommend uh, to find this. It's the first author is, is Colin Martin, published in uh, the Journal of Radiological Protection. Uh, and I want to have a, to make a remark here that not all uh, these events when the JOS exceeds this trigger uh, can be considered as accidental because these overexposures are sometimes just needed for the for the procedure because of the complexity of the procedure of patient's uh, conditions. Uh, and yes, we want to encourage everyone to report to SAFRAT. I will uh, show in a few minutes um, uh, the link to SAFRAT system. Uh, there are plans to develop this system further uh, and to increase the learning possibility because now you report, but there is no option to see uh, the, the, what has been reported. They are cases, they are not systematically reported cases, so I cannot say any percentage of, uh, for example, what percentage of all procedure in a department during one year uh, exceed the trigger level. That is one of the goals we want to achieve in coming years to see what is the real situation in different countries and that will be the further development uh, of the system. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, we can move because there are many questions coming. I adapt we can answer all of them. Uh, maybe, Madam, there is a question uh, for your uh, recent studies on uh, uh, over 100 millisieverts. Uh, these patients with greater than 100 millisievert orders, their age and life term uh, risk. Did you consider also non carcinogenic uh, risk, uh, for example, like cardiac? I think you already mentioned, but maybe you want to comment uh, more on this. Yeah, uh, uh, I did not make specific mention of the cardiac because I put everything under stochastic risk, but uh, increasingly there is emphasis on non-cancer effects, uh, but we have not really studied and estimated that. So um, I think there is a need to do, do assessment in that area also. And also there is a need to really, uh, for others to find the percentages involved, for example, in our large studies, uh, study we found 4% of our patients undergoing interventional radiological procedure exceeding 100. We and this is uh, this excludes the cardiac patients. So uh, we one needs more data on interventional procedures and how many patients are getting higher doses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Uh, when considering stochastic risk, can I suggest the need to consider latency, the time between exposure and manifestation of radiation detriment? Uh, yeah, that is always a, a question mark on the latent uh, period from something like two years to almost 15 years. Uh, I think the best way to think about that is the smoking risk. <laughs> Uh, there was a time when uh, uh, smoking was weighed in the similar way as the stochastic risk. So with the emphasis given to the long-term effect of smoking, there has been now a substantial, substantial decrease in smoking and uh, hopefully I, I believe the cancer, lung cancer risk also. So that was a very good move uh, by various organizations, uh, which has helped immensely. So I think I will put the analogy there and feel that we need to be cognizant of that and take uh, some tips from there. Thank you. Uh, Martin, also to you, uh, you mentioned, uh, I think from your NJH experience, uh, 
age fault reduction of uh, uh, events exceeding the trigger during 2010-17. Is this due uh, to awareness, development in imaging systems, or stringent uh, QA and QC? Yeah, thank you. This is a this is a good question. Uh, my feeling, uh, my experience during the last uh, almost three four decades is, do anything, it will help. And that anything means monitor anything in any way, it will help. The moment you start monitoring, it helps. For example, people started using monitoring for DRL. People say it is the DRL which has given them reduction in percentage of cases, but actually it is the moment you start monitoring, it helps. So in our case, this eightfold reduction came because we started doing monitoring some eight, nine years ago. And as a result, awareness got created. So there were no special really actions with the interventionalists. So there may be action with the physicists, but not uh, big actions with the interventionalists, except that automatically awareness comes, and that is good enough. Thank you. Uh, Werner, maybe you can comment on uh, what is the best method to, uh, or maybe Madam can also add, uh, to get the most accurate doses during the intervention or radiology. There was also a question why Reference air care is monitored and not peak skin dose, which is, I think, uh, maybe the person is not uh, directly involved in intervention or radiology, so you might want to. Maybe I can give a quick response yes. to that. From 2022, IEC, the International Electrotechnical Commission, it has asked for introduction of the skin dose maps. So most machines will start having those maps. The, there has been good agreement on that. So the, these all these things uh, may uh, become uh, get changed from the reference point dose. So, but at the moment, uh, reference point dose is uh, monitored and provided by the machine. It can be directly used, whereas skin dose. Uh, uh, softwares are indirectly and they are not available as such. So it is better to use something which is directly available from the machine and uh, that is good enough. Yeah, and it's easier to set a monitoring program with this to, to be able to monitor all patients who undergo procedures. Uh, Werner, uh, maybe this is more um, clinical question, any idea how to determine procedures where the patient doses are consistently unusually high? Well, dose management systems are, of course, of great help for this problem uh, because you get a, a good um, overview of what is happening in your department. Uh, also, you can identify uh, operators which uh, either have problems doing the procedure or uh, which um, neglect certain um, issues of radiation protection. Uh, since we introduced the dose alert, uh, the number of uh, excessive doses above the trigger level decreased dramatically. So we get only a couple of alerts uh, per year now and actually, uh, radiation-induced skin injuries is not a problem in our institution, um, which I think is also related that the uh, air camera at reference points, in many cases, probably overestimates the skin dose. Uh, yes, I think you made a good point, and uh, I want to highlight again the, the, the important role of monitoring uh, per uh, not all departments uh, have access to, to these uh, uh, systems, but there is a comment from a participant that they use in the department the free software, open RAM software, to, uh, with the same purpose, to, to monitor patient uh, doses and identify patient with uh, doses above the trigger levels. Uh, that also helps. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, uh, so I'm trying to scroll to find another question that we can 
I think there was a question whether we inform the patient before the procedure regarding the deterministic and uh, stochastic risks. We inform the patients regularly uh, about deterministic effects, but only in procedures where we expect or where we see a, 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 a substantial risk that something like this happens. Um, stochastic risks are very difficult to communicate to patients. And uh, I think um, for most radiation exposures in diagnostic radiology and also in interventional radiology, the stochastic risk is, in our opinion, neglectable because uh, there is a, a spontaneous, very high risk of developing a cancer over years. Thank you. Uh, I think it's uh, time to conclude at this point. Uh, there are a few more questions, but we had over 600 participants, and uh, I'm sorry we, uh, we are not able to answer in details of all questions. Uh, you are, of course, uh, welcome to uh, approach um, uh, speakers directly or uh, the IEA. I will show in a few seconds the, web, the, the, the email address. So this is the, the, the email, uh, the, the website, of, uh, the web page of Safrat. You can find not only the registration page for Safrat here, you can find uh, guidelines and forms that you can download, the trigger levels that Dr. Yasuo already uh, showed. Uh, I want to also invite you to uh, enroll for the e-learning courses we have. One of them is based on the six webinars organized earlier on interventional procedures. And I want to announce now the new material that is uh, just launched yesterday, in fact. These are practical tutorials. It's 13 short practical tutorials based on videos that you can use to study the effect of different factors on patient and staff dose. This is now available as e-learning that you, you need to register and use. Uh, but uh, in near future, it will be available for uh, free download if you are trainers and want to use them in your lectures. Uh, just I, I hope uh, it will be very soon available uh, in the RPOP website along with many other materials so that many of you I suppose know and use. And in order to be uh, kept updated, uh, please uh, uh, subscribe to the RPOP newsletter. Uh, with this, you will receive monthly news, monthly updates, what is new on the website and any other events uh, that are uh, organized by the uh, IEA in the field of radiation protection of patients. Uh, with this, I want to thank our, our speakers uh, for this uh, very uh, comprehensive uh, overview of the topic. Uh, we did not have time to go in details, but I want to encourage the participants to view the recording of the previous webinars. There are seven or eight uh, also in other language, in Spanish, in Portuguese, uh, in Russian, uh, in topics related to radiation protection and interventional procedures. Uh, Madam and Werner, if you want to say a few words at the end before we close. No, thank you very much, Zenia, for organizing this uh, webinar. Uh, I saw uh, good interest from the participants, both in terms of the number of participants as well as the questions. Uh, as you rightly expressed, uh, apologies for not being able to attend to all the questions. So I add my apologies. Uh, participants can reach out to us. And I wish to thank uh, Werner for the wonderful cooperation we had all these months to prepare this webinar. And this webinar went very well, thanks to uh, the people who have assisted you in, uh, and thanks to the participants. Thank you, everyone. Over to Werner. Thank you to you, Yenya, and your organization for organizing this uh, very important webinar. 
I think it's a very good idea that we bring together the operators, the users of radiation, and uh, the medical physics experts who uh, can assist us to improve our daily practice. So thanks to everybody and thanks to the audience who stayed with us for such a long time and listened to our talk. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you again. Uh, I see quite a few questions uh, on the issuing certificates. As I announced at the beginning at the opening, unfortunately, the IA does not provide certification for the webinar. Uh, I'm sorry for this, but uh, these are the, the rules internally. Uh, and uh, finally, before I close, I want to invite you to register for the next webinar on 16th of March. It will be uh, with IOMP and with Dr. Rihani again on also a hot topic uh, in nowadays on uh, recurrent imaging in uh, radiological procedure, this time focusing on CT imaging and managing cumulative uh, theosis. Uh, with this, I want to thank you all uh, and wish uh, you a wonderful day or night, whenever you are, and you may now disconnect. Goodbye.